So viewed from space, it is merely a thin blue line, a wisp of air above a massive Earth. If we could put it on a scale and weigh it compared to the world's oceans, it would be less than a hundredth of its mass. Yet that thin wisp represents what in many ways is the most important of Earth's layers, and at the same time, the most fragile to human perturbations. I remember preparing to speak to a troop of Cub Scouts about the atmosphere. One of the dads turns to his six-year-old son and says, son, I bet you don't even know what the atmosphere is. Sure I do, daddy, the boy replied. That's where the meteorites burn up when they're trying to crash into the Earth. And of course he was right. But in many ways, that ability to protect us from these extraterrestrial objects is the least fragile and uh, the most robust of all of the atmosphere's functions because it's really the bulk of all of the air and its friction that keeps them from crashing into us. Most of the atmosphere's other functions that affect health, affect climate, affect ecosystems, arise from very minuscule quantities of trace gases in the air that are far more difficult to measure and far more interesting to study. Edward Lorenz famously coined the phrase butterfly effect to describe how something as insignificant as a butterfly flapping its wings could affect the motions of winds and the creation of storms a world away. In many ways, the chemistry of the atmosphere is even more vulnerable and susceptible to those butterfly-scale butterfly perturbations than the meteorology is, but far less well understood. Things are rather stable when it comes to inert gases that comprise the vast majority of air we breathe, things like oxygen, nitrogen, argon. Contrary to popular misconceptions, we don't need to worry about having any less than the 21% or so oxygen that we have that keeps us alive, no matter what we do with fossil fuels, with forests, or just about anything else you could imagine. However, it's the trace compounds that are the basis of my research that vitally influence climate and health and are far more sensitive to human activities. Small swings in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have marked each of the transitions between recent ice ages and interglacial periods, and even bigger changes that we're putting into the greenhouse gases in the air now are expected to dramatically affect climate in the decades to come. We speak of the stratospheric ozone layer as if it was some massive shield of ozone protecting us from the sun's UV rays, but in fact, if you compressed it all down to to standard pressure, you'd only be talking about a couple of centimeters worth of pure air. That same ozone forms in very different ways near the ground, different processes, and it's a smog pollutant near the ground. And just a single ozone molecule out of every 10 million air molecules is enough to trigger an ozone smog alert in Houston or make it more difficult for the old and the young to breathe. Similarly, if I was to put just a tiny fraction of a gram of fine particles, disperse it throughout air, the volume of this room, breathing just that much particulate matter over the course of a decade would be enough to raise all of our risks of death, of illness, of all sorts of diseases by substantial percentages. Fortunately, we're just here for, for the five minute talks of these lectures. On even smaller scales, one of the gases that gets the most attention in our research is hydroxyl radical which at quantities of just one molecule out of every trillion molecules of air is so reactive and so potent that it's able to clean out the vast majority of pollutants in our atmosphere. Very difficult to measure, very poorly understood. These compounds are fascinating to study, not just because of their high potency, but also because of the nonlinearity and the sensitivity with which they respond to human perturbations. How much air quality will improve from a emission control measure depends tremendously on where that measure is done, when it's done, and intricate details of the atmospheric chemistry of that region. Many southern states learned this the hard way when they spent billions of dollars mimicking the same control strategies that worked extremely effectively to clean up Los Angeles, fog, Los Angeles smog, but did almost no good to clean up the smog in their own regions. We're also increasingly learning how climate, ozone depletion, and air quality though in many ways they should be viewed as, as three separate phenomena, actually do interact in highly interesting ways that are still very poorly understood. All of these complexities and interactions create challenges for policymakers, but also provide opportunities for atmospheric scientists like myself to model and conduct other research that's both scientifically rigorous and highly re relevant to policy. 
as a math guy who started college searching for some way that I could use that math for the greater good, I found my perfect home in atmospheric science, providing a basis for a career of scientific research. Thank you. Thank you so much.